for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here uh, to try to show you the path that I, I got uh, until I managed to, to get all these, all these works approved and how these interfaces come. So I have here prepared a presentation that I need permission to share um, so that I can show you. And um, globally, the presentation. Uh, I don't know who is coordinating the. Joana well, Souza, Joana, you have to give the permission to, to share. Okay. Now you can. Now you can. Okay, thank you so much. So. Uh, I'm going to guide you through, through a, a presentation that mostly relates to the to the track in time that I got to since I started research until now. So I will try to speak about the origin and the future of this ERC grant that hits my life in the middle. Uh, uh, this uh, presentation is outlined by starting in the past for you to understand the context of it how the idea comes and what is the context be behind the main idea and uh, what are the progresses in future, which indeed regard also the present because the RC already terminated uh, some years ago. So starting uh, by the beginning of my research work, I started uh, research activities uh, with Professor Costa Lima in the, in the Faculty of Pharmacy of Porto University before I had the degree completed, a six year degree, because at the time they took longer than they take now. And I started with IN selective electrodes. Uh, for common sense, these are like pH electrodes that everyone has in the lab, but they use instead of glass membranes, they use polymeric membranes. We have the perspex tubes and uh, we have a very complex uh, process of production. They look nice and they were quite effective in terms of monitoring uh, different compounds. We prepared the cocktail with the membrane that we've applied over a conductive material that was made of graphite. And uh, we could prepare uh, eventually any, any ion selective electrode to any compound that would, be, would bear a charge. And so this is where my research started. This is one year starting to work from morning to night uh, to have all this work ready. And this was my first uh, approach into research. So this became my PhD in the end because uh, we transformed this conventional shape of the electrodes into tubular shape. And instead of having the membranes applied uh, on top of the electrodes, they were applied in the middle in the hole so that they would have a laminar flow and there would be an interface of the flow path. So this was my PhD to have uh, polymeric membranes with an ionophore that would be able to recognize the compound that I would be willing to recognize inserted into uh, flow injection analysis systems. Uh, uh, having said that, I started then to work, uh, finished the PhD, and wanted to innovate, innovate, and somehow uh, I was stuck by reading different papers with molecularly imprinted polymers. And I understood that these compounds were polymeric materials that were able to recognize specific compounds. I think around 2004, I would be reading these papers and I was trying to connect this with the ion selective electrodes that I, I have done in the past. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the end, uh, I took the opportunity of a postdoc uh, from Egypt, which was Ayman uh, Kamel, who came to Portugal to work with me. And I told him that I wanted to make this interface and he studied that in the lab and the idea worked out. And this was more or less the third publication in the world because I took many years to be able to fulfill it in, in time. Uh, but indeed, it was the first approach that I, that I had in time in which I combined molecular imprinted polymers with uh, the ability to recognize ions. Uh, these are very important materials in my perspective because with a polymer, a polymer and a template, you can shape almost anything that you want to be able to recognize almost anything that you want. Of course, this is not, uh, nothing is, is completely uh, forever and always, but uh, almost always this can be possible and this can be feasible. So uh, 
I progressed into the electrochemical sen biosensors with him and Felizmina, the, who was not my PhD student. She became my PhD student later. And we were doing carbon-based electrodes for the first time in a similar approach to what we did in the ion selective electrodes, but without the membrane and using electrochemistry to, to fulfill that. And we also were able to modify some electrodes to be able to detect with electrochemistry other compounds, which is not uh, exactly potentiometry, it's another electrical technique. And uh, importantly, I went abroad uh, to have some studies abroad with Rosa Dutra, who was a professor at the time at the University of Pernambuco, and now she's, she's belonging to the Federal University of Pernambuco. And she brought me into my mind something that I did not pay attention in the literature, which is very important, which is uh, that we can uh, establish single layer or monolayer modifications in the surface of flat electrodes. And this is very interesting because uh, this brings you to the mind the ability that you have to think on small modifications that you can bear at the nanoscale of the materials. And as I had organic chemistry teaching, teaching, this became very important to me to be able to manipulate very small amounts of compounds in a single approach. Uh, this was the background to start a new research group that I started uh, alone with, not alone, with my PhD students at the time, which were not as few. Uh, so I had five PhD students and we started a new group to, re to study research around these topics that were indeed the past that lead led me to this direction. And basically this is the, the sign of, of the group. And it means that we are combining life and this is what means that part of the symbol. And we are combining life by uh, electrical signals uh, because this is the uh, electrical shape of redox probe when you have the electrochemistry. So our purposes in science were mostly uh, directly to monitor, to produce sensing materials. And the sensing materials would have a technical device somehow that we be, would be able to be applied into society and to something that would be interesting using engineering in between. So our sensing materials started to be in a more small scale approach. And uh, we introduced several, uh, started studying several uh, materials for sensing complex compounds, which are mostly protein biomarkers that circulate in the body. Also, we had some studies with antibiotics, but the most important studies were the, the biomarkers of disease because those are complex molecules. And uh, one example of that is uh, the studies of how to imprint on a surface uh, uh, for to detect, in this case, myoglobin. Um, globally, this was a, a, an innovative approach that we introduced at the time that we called a, a SPAM because it was a, a smart pla a plastic uh, antibody material. SPAM is, a, is a, something that keeps in, in, in the sound. And we use the gold surface electrodes, eventually a flat gold surface to which we bond the protein. And then we anchor there by ionic interactions, just monomers uh, that would uh, interact by complementarity with the charges of the protein. We polymerize the round with a neutral uh, matrix so that we would not have charges. It's not completely apolar, but it's neutral. And then we remove the template. And we were amazed because this was the first time that we got to see the plastic antibodies on an electron microscopy because the holes on the polymer, on the polymer structure would meet the way myoglobin uh, is existing in serum. So we this was our first um, um, our first recognition that the plastic antibodies would really exist, because it's difficult to to speak about things that we imagine and that you cannot see in reality. And we had some difficulties with the previous work, which is to control the, the thickness of the polymer so that we do not cover the protein, because if you don't take out the protein, you don't have the binding position to recognize the compound again. So instead of being uh, worried with the thickness of the polymer, we decided to create a very uh, large uh, thickness polymer uh, so that instead of um, taking out the protein from by that side, we would take out the protein from the other side. And so we, we connected the top layer of the polymer to another uh, electrochemical device, and then we stripped the first 
uh, one that had the proteins. And this was really an amazing thing because when we stripped out, we had all the target biomolecules were on top of the electrodes. So it was the first time that we had really many, many rebinding positions uh, in a, a very small spot. And so this electrode became very, very sensitive and very able to reproduce uh, a very complex matrix uh, samples. And we were also exploring the transducers because uh, although I'm a pharmacist from background, I think my soul is become, uh, has become an engineer in the middle. And so we started without uh, money, this research group, or few money, of course. And then we started using everything that was there in the lab that could be used to have science done. And so we started by installing syringes. Uh, that we packed, instead of having the prospects of my PhD uh, thesis, we had insulin syringes packed with the um, graphite and the epoxy uh, glue. And we just put the copper wire in between and then we casted the, the, the selective membrane on top. So we spend less membrane and we spend less money on the assembly of the electrodes. Uh, we also uh, shifted to a very interesting um, approach, which is the, the simple uh, thing of reusing the, the, the pipette tips that we throw away in, in, into trash when we, when we are in a lab. Uh, because this, in the end, this became a very simple and very sensitive electrode, even more, ele more sensitive than the ones we have on the left. And this is a potentiometric device. Uh, I think you can see there's here a wire. This is a silver wire. And the selective membrane is here on the tip, on the tip. Uh, ends and uh, it's it is a PVC based membrane so when it tries it blocks the passage of the solution there is a solution inside here as you can see and this system can be 10 times more sensitive than the one on the left so we started using this uh, micro pipette tips also to construct electrodes uh, of course, we need to evolve and uh, handling samples, biological samples, is something that is very uh, complex because you need to use very small volumes, not just because the samples do not exist in high amount, but mostly because uh, the samples, you can use uh, milliliters of samples, likely, but you cannot afford to have standard solutions or very expensive compounds used in milliliters to throw away. So we can all use microliters. And so the screen printed electrodes became very useful because you use, I don't know, about 20 microliters and that's enough to have a measure of a sample. So um, that increases a lot the costs of, the, of the, the overall research. So we started using these electrodes to have a single drop covering this area of the three electrodes and this would be enough to have uh, samples analyzed. Of course, after using these electrodes, you need to throw them away. And we always threw them away in the same box. And one day I arrived at the lab and I said, we need to do something to these things because we cannot throw this away. This is valuable. It has ceramics, uh, silver strips. And so one day I decided that we could recycle this. And what we did was to cut this piece off because this is no longer useful because it is modified with something and we cannot reuse it. And so I cut that part off and we uncovered this plastic cover in blue and we started using this as a multiplex device. So this is here the reference electrode and these are two PVC membranes for two opposite compounds. And so this became uh, the possibility of having uh, double uh, analytes analyzed at the same time in a single solution at almost cost zero because we have this support there to uh, to just to throw away and we ended up not throwing throwing away all. Uh, in parallel, we also had some very inexpensive studies, which were the same PVC membranes that I used for the ion selective electrodes. I use them to incorporate some sensing elements to detect antibiotics that could change color in the presence of antibiotics. So this is like a PVC strip for antibiotics that change color in, instead of pH senses antibiotics is similar to that. And of course, in time we evolved from shifting the antibiotics, uh, shifting the PVC strips to cellulose strips, 
because uh, throwing away PVC strips is not environmentally nice. So we started modifying the in a self-assembled monolayer approach the cellulose substrates to be able to promote a color change on the substrate of the cellulose and have a color indication. And so basically we reached this point and uh, from all the works that we have done, I think the, the area where we much evolved was the electrochemistry and this had the great potential, but this also had uh, limitations that needed to be fulfilled. So in the past, I had had experience in biosensors uh, either with biological recognition elements or with, uh, uh, with synthetic recognition elements. And basically, they, um, I think my frontier was mostly to handle the materials and the nanotechnology and to have them apply to something. And something, of course, I'm a pharmacist and health is more, uh, to me, I'm more sensitive to, 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 to concerns related to health. So my past has driven me to biosensors and indeed, I am a woman of science. Uh, I used to say that it's easier for me to do science than to handle with the people around. Not because uh, I am there not speaking to people, not because of that. It's because science, uh, for me, it's interesting. Uh, it's straightforward and we can imagine and we can go and experiment. And people, we are all much more complex. So we are almost much more challenging to each other. I think it's more easy to do science. So I leave science from the ground and my soul is a soul of a scientist. And so uh, I am related to science as a, as a question of life uh, purpose. And so I would pursue something that would be very challenging in, in science. And of course, I have several people around that uh, some of them challenging, challenging more than others. It doesn't matter. The question is, is that they exist and we need to carry on with innovative ideas to be able to, to, to help them moving through science as well. So having all this combination, uh, we arrived to three Ps. The Ps of the grants, uh, Professor George Gwen already said them, they are not past person and people. I was doing the slides and understood they were all the, the same connection of three Ps, but that's not what they mean. Indeed, the, the starting grants, uh, in, has plastic antibodies, which is another name that you give to molecular imprinted polymers when it targets biomolecules. Uh, it combines photovoltaics. Why? Because electrochemistry has a problem, not a problem. It uh, uh, has something that should could be improved, which is when you go to a diabetic person that uses the electrochemistry to monitor glucose, that's interesting, but uh, you have a machine that you need to have a readout. Either if you don't have the machine, you don't have the readout, you don't have the amount of glucose. So what I was imagining at the time, uh, thinking on how to improve was to, uh, why cannot we provide them the system, a source of energy so that we don't need no longer a machine. And the idea is to throw away the machine, don't need to have an equipment. And so the photovoltaic cells would be able to provide the electrical energy that would feed the system. And in another sense, we need also to have an improved sensitivity because the plastic antibodies are going to impact the photovoltaic cells. So plasmonics is one simple way to reach that. Uh, I think it was not a critical element in these three Ps, uh, but it was one of the, the elements that was uh, predicted since the beginning. So starting from photovoltaic cells, uh, I later started interacting with Professor Deli Mendes, well known by this field uh, of dye-sensitized solar cells. These cells are very related to photosynthetic systems like uh, in the environment, so they are very, um, uh, they are very suited for a disposable device. Uh, in terms, it uses a very simple process of having a semiconductor on one of the electrodes with a dye, and the dye receives the light, and the electron moves into a higher level, and then this electrode is injected into the semiconductor and is obliged to circulate outside the system. When it arrives, the second electrode, it will migrate by diffusion uh, to be able to use redox iodides 
compound that will regenerate the dye. Of course, this is not 100% effective. This is much beyond from being 100% as this is, but uh, partially 5, 10, 15% of the system works as this. And so it is possible to have energy output from these photovoltaic systems. And in the end, what we want to do is to put the plastic antibodies on these electrodes uh, to limit the electrical flow according to the amount of protein that should be bound to the system. The plasmonics, uh, it had uh, also cooperation with Professor Tito Trindade from Alveiro. Uh, the plasmonics was done to try to improve the, um, the electrical output of the system. So what we did was to have a photovoltaic cell and just to put it the parallel one, which would have also uh, gold nanoparticles. We did not have great achievements, but it improved a lot. And we saw later that it improved more than the power. It improved another uh, thing that I will tell you, tell you later, but plasmonics became important in the end. And the plastic antibodies is the, the core of the, the biomark team. And indeed, uh, what we did in this work uh, was to have the photo anode in one side and the, the plastic antibody on the other electrode. It was obtained very simply. I'm very fond of electropolymerization, who was a, which was a suggestion of Lishmin in the past from seeing in other works, which is you just put the monomers and the proteins on top of a given electrode, and then you start, you give an electrical uh, condition, and then the monomers, uh, the radical polymerization starts existing in situ in a very simple way. And so it's a very straightforward process, in, and you can do it in five minutes, uh, 10 minutes, whatever you want. Uh, it's a very much more simple than what you do in a radical polymerization in a bulk solution. And so what we understood from this work is that indeed, if you increase the protein, which is in this case is cancer uh, embryonic antigen, uh, the output of the uh, photovoltaic cell will be decreasing, of course, because the protein is blocking here the passage of the electron, so it should be decreasing, it's an additional resistance. Uh, but we're pursuing autonomy because I wanted to throw away the equipment. And to be able to have this autonomy, then we needed to have an optical interface, something that could be detected by the eye. And to have, uh, there is a special cell that makes this interface between the electrical part and the optical part. And this is the electrochromic cell. You feed it with electricity and gives you a color. If you give more electricity, it changes to another color or another intensity of color. So what we did here was to, to have a first start on the electrochromic cell interactions. And what happens is that when you have, for instance, no uh, cancer biomarker bond to the cell, in the end, you have this color, which means maximum electrical output of the photovoltaic cell. And when you have some blocking in the system, it changed to a kind of gray. And so that means you have a lot of cancer biomarker in the sample fluid. So the overall system would be like this in this complexity. You'd have the photovoltaic cell and the plastic antibody in one of the electrodes and an electrochromic cell in between. Our best version uh, and the way we can anticipate this device was to have the two electrodes. Mm. And then on the two electrodes, you have the one has the photo one, and then the other one has plastic antibody. On the electrode of plastic antibody, you put blood to incubate in the sample. Then you wash out and you put uh, just wash with buffer and you set up the cell. To set up the cell, you need that redox iodide in the middle. And then you have the final cell. And this final cell, when it's heated by light, shall uh, produce current that feeds the electrochromic cell that is here and then changes color. So our, the best event that we got was with the, the photovoltaic cell with the plasmonic nanoparticles and the color really changed from a, a light blue to a very dark blue with the cancer biomarker. So we were very happy with this ending of the story because we were able to produce this um, combination of photovoltaics, plasmonics, and plastic antibodies all together in an optical readout that would be able to have a self-signal and self-power device. So we could throw away the equipment in this condition. This was the most important output of the RC grant. 
Of course, uh, this ERC grant brings you uh, money, possibility to innovate and willing to innovate because you start uh, going into the clouds and dreaming about other things that you can do in science. So we started doing many different things throughout time and in this period. Uh, one of it was uh, just use paper and cover it with ink and use this as an electrode. This is a very simple electrode uh, with a, a plastic antibody tailored on top in situ so that you can use very, very inexpensive material to produce just a single biosensor. Uh, we also had a combination with PCBs from the computers, an idea that came from a colleague from his app uh, that works in electronics. Uh, and then she works with PCBs and for, for, for her perspective, it would be possible to do that. It's not very easy, but uh, Felizmina managed to put these electrodes working. Uh, this could be improved, but the interface with PCB became possible as well. And uh, I got to collaborate in a request to receive some, some students uh, to operate with, um, with the plastic antibodies in our lab. And we uh, got to have uh, printed electrodes with homemade carbon ink and just made by hand. And these were flexible ones. And this knowledge was brought by, uh, by that colleague from Barcelona. And we also got to have screen printed electrodes in any surface that we want. These ones used PET, but today we already made it in cork. I did not include these works, but we have different ways of producing these electrodes by hand. And this also includes a collaboration with that uh, professor from Brazil that I went first for an external study. And of course, Professor Alvira is well known by uh, paper electronics. And so she also was involved in our works with printings of the cellulose substrates. And it was the first time we did it together and it was a very, very interesting approach. And after doing that, she's very fond of laser. So uh, she started producing graphene in situ by laser incidents. And we also use that approach to produce uh, electrodes that are not screen printed, but they are laser uh, produced by laser incidents. And they were very, very interested. We also evolved this now to, to monitor double electrodes. Uh, we were also able to have our plastic antibodies tailored on quantum dots, uh, which are fluorescent uh, reading probes. Uh, that can have different applications for analytical reasons in a, in a collaboration with the Faculty of Pharmacy. And we also ended up collaborating uh, with, uh, with the Professor Vitor Freitas from the Faculty of Sciences and Duncan Sutherland from Morris University uh, to create nanodisks that were the PhD of Joana Guerreiro, uh, to create nanodisks to put plastic antibodies on the nanodisks and to have laser localized surface from um, plasma resonance. Instead of having the very expensive SPR equipment, you use a single spectrophotometer to have these readings uh, if you are able to create these nanodisks uh, in a very controlled fashion. And eventually, by an idea, uh, an idea of Manuela Frasco, uh, we ended up producing plastic antibodies on, on nanostructured sensors that have a color that changes according to their distance of the of the nanostructured elements. And it, when you put there the protein, the distance shifts somehow so that the reflectance of the system changes or the color directly changes. We are aiming to have really a color change and not just a reflection change. Uh, but the main idea is always to have very low cost devices that can be disposed of and equipment free. And this is one of the possibilities that we arrive from here. So in the end, we have a whole bunch of new technology in all this process of the RC grant. And this brings you to a new level of ability to collaborate with others. Of course, we were able to attract funding, as Professor George Coyne said, uh, and together a team that was able to progress with a different purpose of the technology. Uh, this symbiotic process started by uh, hiring a PhD grant um, from Professor Adelio. Uh, who brought up uh, the knowledge uh, of the dye-sensitized solar cells, but then she worked really in fuel cells. Uh, so she started posing the idea that instead of using fuel cells, we could use, uh, instead of using photovoltaic cells, we could use uh, 
um, fuel cells, and that's what we try to do, and it became really possible. Uh, we are progressing now this work, and it's becoming amazing, just beyond our expectations. And But basically, it starts with a carbon black that's what's used in fuel cells and platinum, and we create plastic antibodies around this, um, this platinum. Uh, the transducing element is indeed the fuel cell and the fuel cell uses this uh, plastic antibodies that we are creating here so we are creating the ability of our target compound to interact with the material that composes the electrodes of the fuel cell and when we set up the fuel cell if you put there the sample it will block the electrical flow electrical flow in the same way that it happened to the photovoltaic cell. So this time we learned and we knew how to use the electrochromic element, which in this case was produced by a novel from Professor Elvira. And um, in the end, what is got was a, a completely full device that you can uh, operate in a way that you don't need light to produce electricity, but you need a chemical. So you need something always. Uh, in the case of the starting grant, I would have the uh, light. And in this case, I can have methanol or other alcohols that we already tested and they are working in. And there are two PhD students working in this still, which are Nadia and Liliana working at, at the time in Porto. And basically what how this is operating, it's very easy. We just put the, the sample on, on the electrode that has the plastic antibody. So if there is no biomarker, there's nothing there and we all wash it out. And then we connect the electrochromic system and once we feed the cell with methanol, because this, this cell is operating with methanol, it will uh, trigger the electrochromic cell into its maximum color potential. Uh, if we have the biomarker there now, then the biomarker is attaching into the plastic antibody. And what makes this uh, block some part of the system and then the electrical output that is fed, fed to the electrochromic cell will not be as intense and so the color becomes less intense and this is more or less how it operates and how it stands um, evolving but it's really we are going to have news soon because the, this work is really getting uh, very hot at the moment so um, this brings us up to mind gap mind gap is a is a story of uh, past knowledge because it brings us new innovative devices but in the collaboration of others of course and um, but it's also a question of personal experience because this this mind comes from um, an idea that someone someone defied me to do plastic antibodies to extracellular vesicles i had already tried to do that in the past in a call it failed uh, by by uh, by some colleagues that work very well in in EVs, and then uh, my response was that that was not uh, going to to work well, and we needed to have some other perspective over the EVs. And one thing from my personal experience is that we had coaching and meditation activities within the research group, which was very important to have all the team working together. And I understood that at that moment that meditation had somehow uh, some positive benefits in terms of focus and efficiency and well-being around the team. And regardless that, I was able to see in the literature that meditation had some positive benefits in health. So, as the, and I also learned from reading that the um, extracellular vesicles, they also cross the blood-brain barrier. So, uh, the overall assum assumption of this project is very simple. So, if there is something that your brain does to your body, it does with things that exist not by miracles, eventually, eventually. Eventually, miracles are things that we don't know yet because science is far from knowing uh, all and we have many things to learn yet. So, um, as we don't understand how this happens, so we are trying here to understand how this communication is existing and how the, the brain is communicating. But we also need biosensors to monitor that. So that's what we are triggering in this uh, very important project that may open a new door into health monitoring, which is very important because before you get sick, there are many things that happen in your body. And if we discover that before you get sick, 
maybe you don't get sick in, in the next years. And that is very important. So basically this project is combining the plastic antibodies that we all know, but this time for extracellular vesicles. So it's a more complex way of imprinting. And we are combining in a very multidisciplinary domains. And this, uh, I want to tell you that this Fat Open projects, they are really, really exclusively for multidisciplinary activities. Some things, some topics that you get together and they would not mean in a conventional way. So we are really combining here uh, microfluidics, plastic antibiotics, and informatics in the sense that we are wanting to design a new biosensor device. And we are combining also uh, exosomes and mind and brain interactions with the IPO portal and several um, activities uh, with uh, patients uh, under mindfulness events on the, on the side of the mind brain related events. So this is a very important project that I am hoping that is bringing benefits into society. Of course, the, all this travel also has changed in life. That's what Professor Jorge Coelho also said. Uh, I was working in, in ESEP for about 20 years and then I decided to start a new experience in my life by moving to University of Coimbra. Uh, and we are uh, working together in a very close interaction, of course, our biomark team in UC and our biomark team in, in ESEP because we have the common uh, targets and we want to uh, have a synergic event instead of an, instead of an addition. So we are together, we are more than our individuals. And of course, after all this time, uh, I think it is important to uh, take care of our external uh, connections and internal connections in Portugal, because they are very important and they may allow you to interact with other topics. Uh, about uh, interactions with other teams, I would say that it's more important to interact with other people that don't understand anything about your work. Uh, because they will bring you uh, new information. If you interact with people that work in the same field as you, it will be easier because your conversation is very straightforward, but likely you won't learn a lot. So it's better to interact with people that may have a complementary effect on the studies that you want. And of course, this brings people. We, uh, Because I moved in, in the year of the COVID to Coimbra, we did not have the opportunity to have a common picture. So you have here uh, the team and the new members that have joined uh, so far. And I used to say that the world is in, is in the hands of each other. And whatever you do in life is whatever is, is becoming later something. So if you are thinking on doing something, do something good for others and good for yourself. That is very important. And define a target. If I could say to someone to do something, uh, maybe you need to think what you want to do and then try to fight for that target. And if that target is important to you and is important to society, I'm sure it will be fulfilled. And uh, if you do it, do it with your heart and with your soul. Don't do it just to please others, just to play, because it's important that you do it by the heart. And that's the only way you are going to get enough strength to, to go until the end, because this is hard work. Thank you so much for your time. Okay. Thank you, Goretti, for your amazing, really impressive seminar. So, I mean, I think everybody should be proud of your work. It's really impressive. <laughs> so, uh, we, we have time for questions, please. So, you are so clear that nobody has questions. <laughs> so, any question? Okay, people need to think a little bit more. So I have, a digestion. Well, I have two questions. One is more technical, the other one not. So I'm going to start with the technical one. So when you are showing this um, laser technologies to prepare the electrodes, I did not understand very well. What, what are the, the advantage of this process? The one that you mentioned that you have in collaboration with Alvida for that. Uh, the advantage is, uh, George, is that uh, it's like putting them in a printer, but the printer is a laser. You don't need the ink. So instead of casting the ink on the surface of the electrodes, you can uh, use a polymer 
and the laser hits the, the cell straits with a high power and temperature, and so it burns. But depending on the conditions that it is heated, it can produce graphene, which is very conductive. Okay, okay, okay. And so, but the, the final weight, it will be very interesting because it's printing with a laser. And then you have a graphene surface that can yeah, have well, very good. I was not understanding why, when you are using this process, it will be the, the surface will, be, especially if you are using a polymer, it will become conductive. But now you understand, you, you explain. Okay, okay, perfect. The other question is not not technical because, as you know, we have discussed it some of the <laughs> this work. <laughs> our colleagues, fortunately, for us, our department, you decide to come here, which was big news for everybody here um so the other question is also related with our idea to our idea to create this seminar i mean try to help people that wants to apply for an erc and my question is i mean you explained very well the rationale that have taken you from the idea to the rc and how the best experiments influence your decisions i mean this was pretty clear. So, but from your experience, what do you think should be the process in order to get one of the CRC grants uh, financed or funded? But what do you think are the critical steps or the critical points that everybody that wants to apply or to prepare one of these grants should take in consideration? I think, uh, I think we need to separate the writing from the idea. Okay. One, one thing is the idea is what are you willing to do? If it is very evident, uh, I think I saw the name of João Mano, so he will be uh, much yeah, more experienced yeah. to respond to that than me. But <laughs> if you, yes, <laughs> but if you if you <laughs> if you think the idea is evident, then forget it because it's not interesting. Okay. So you should grab some idea that is not. Uh, to be able to move forward and beyond technology, you should be able to imagine something that is not obvious at the moment. For instance, MindGap is not, is not a, an ERC grant, but it could be because it's going beyond. And beyond is going into a simple thing is that nobody knows how the mind controls the body. And if we knew how to, uh, the dimension in what it happens, for instance, we have about 30% placebo effect. So at least 30% of the cures of people may be an outcome of the mind. And this is very significant numbers. So if we could control, if we would know that, it would be interesting, but nobody thought about it yet. And that is why this project got funded because it's trying to find a route to that. But the idea is obvious now because it is translated into a project, but by the time it was not because nobody uh, got to, uh, question why did it happen and uh, although everyone knows that stress causes disease and health uh, and meditation causes health but this struggle was something very little in science that was there that is very important and nobody answered that yet and but the or, or else you can go into a very novel perspective I, I think I used to say that in the past that if you imagine a car flying you are in the good direction because if you imagine a car in the ground uh, and you are aiming to have a better Ferrari, then forget it, because that's not the way. You, you are not trying to improve what currently exists. You are trying to create new things. So the idea of having new ideas is really new ideas. So if you think it's logical, maybe it's not the right path. You should go into something that is further away that can move technology much beyond than the existence of the current technology. So. This, this is the part of the idea. And then this is the part of writing, because you may have a wonderful idea, but if you have difficulties in transmitting the idea, then it will be very hard for people to understand where you want to, to go. So the part of writing, I think, is very, very important, and it should be very objective. And people say, it's not my idea, people say that if you want to have a good proposal, you give it to read to someone that does not know anything about it. And if that person understands, you are in a good track. If that person does not understand, then change your writing because it should be understood 
by anyone. And that is a fact, because if you, uh, I, I, I know that by experience, when we write the articles in nine selective electorates, it's lo it looks like sometimes a closed world and people that look from outside don't understand that quickly. So uh, when you are in a specific field, you start handling it in a closed manner. So we should open your mind into a way that that field should be treated in an open scenario and everyone should be able to understand whatever you are trying to write, regardless the field in which they work. Of course, I'm not talking for people who, who work in arts and humanities, but I'm talking for people who work in science and technology. So if you work in a radical polymerization, you should be able to understand my plastic antibodies. And if I'm talking about my plastic antibodies, some, someone that works in cancer biomarkers should be able to understand what they are. So there's, a, a, there's an open field, uh, uh, an open ground that should be explored to allow people to understand whatever you are writing. So I think this, these are the two main topics, the idea and the writing. The idea should be disruptive and not logical at all. If you are going to a logical path, then try to change the path and try to find a new way into your, into your idea. And if you are trying to write, do it clearly and do it in a way that everyone understood, understands. Okay, right, thanks. So we have time for questions. No questions. <laughs> <laughs> People are digesting. This is maybe maybe a little bit too much. Uh, no, 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 no. I think progress in technology. I, I think I think that uh, this is is. Um, too much, too much uh, specific, uh, at least for me, uh, that I'm a mechanical engineer, I have some difficulties in understanding some, uh, some of, of the things. I think that, that, that I got the, the, the main idea, but there's a lot of, of, of the scientific details about the materials that uh, I have some difficulties in, in understanding, but anyway, I think I, I, I got the main idea and I, I'm, I'm very, very interested in interesting your, your work. So congratulations. And I think that, and I like Otto, I like in your presentation is that you have, you have by step, step by step and the publication related with, with that, that topic or that step that, uh, that you achieved in terms of results and you present the publication. So for someone that works exactly in this field, I think it's very helpful to, to understand well what, what, what you did. I also had the, the, the question about the, the, the grant that the, but George, George asked you, and I think that you explained very well the, the, the main idea uh, for 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 trying to 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 achieve that that goal, I think that you are you are very clear about that. Thank, Thank you. you the 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 idea of the papers is that uh, I realized somewhere in the past that uh, everything you do counts, and there are some important steps. Not uh, all papers are important, of course, especially for the students, uh, because they bring some knowledge into them and they bring something new. But uh, regardless of that, when you look uh, into the past, there are specific marks in the papers that brought new challenges or new, or new routes or new ways of doing things. And that's what I wanted to highlight with the papers because indeed, uh, we, 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 we have many things to do. We don't get time to stop and to look and to see how was the path but I think it is like that. If we all if we all look to our past, I think it will be that we are going to find some specific timing points that will bring you into the direction in which you you were in. And by the time we did not realize because we were living the moment in the present. But when we look in the past, it's interesting to understand the way the the works the word uh, the work evolved and the way the technology was evolved and why we reached into those ideas um uh, for instance uh, this this idea of the photovoltaic cells um i realized by then that I, I read some things about the photovoltaic cells just because of the dyes it's like when i read the molecular imprinted polymers 
I read because I was reading something about chromatography and then I, I, I stepped in into the technology and they understood that, but if they recognize these compounds, they could recognize those in the potentiometry as well. So when we are reading site works, I was reading photovoltaic cells, but I don't work in photovoltaic cells. So sometimes when we are reading site works that are outside our field, they become in the end very important because if we do it in an open mind, somehow may, maybe there is an interface. It, it may not have an interface, but it may. And in the end, we always learn. So uh, I think that's the point where the, the science meet when we have different areas of knowledge and we can bridge them in a way that becomes a new thing and a new story in, in, in research. Thank you, Josh. Okay. I, I have I have another another question. It's it's not exactly a question. It, I think that it's more like a more like a joke. But uh, anyway, um, <laughs> I, I, I found that the, Sara Sara Carvalho left University of Minho and went to Coimbra. So you you also said that you went to Coimbra. So I think that <laughs> what do you think? Do you think that we are like uh, assisting uh, something or uh, that is like like the soccer? That we are we are trying to attract the, the best <laughs> researchers in Portugal because th this this is true in the United States uh, as as I think that everybody knows that they try to attract the best professors to to their uh, universities. So I think that is, this is probably uh, something that is going to happen in Portugal uh, more frequently, trying to attract the the. The, the best professors for their groups. I don't know. Well, do you have an idea about that or opinion? I, I, I'm new in the, in the university, so maybe maybe George can speak about it. But uh, I think it is interesting. We are um, uh, we used to say in Portugal, uh, if you change, God helps. Uh, and in a way, sometimes it is important that. Uh, I also want to look in the past. There are sometimes things in my life in which I have changes. And the changes are severe because they take you out of your comfort zone. But they always move you to somewhere and somewhere beyond that you would be if you stayed in your, in your place. So uh, I had a, all my lab set up with million zeros there and people working, a, a team of 20 to 30 members. And so starting all over again, it's not easy. It's a, it's a hard task, but then it's a challenge and it's the possibility of starting something fresh, something new in a new place. And of course, if that becomes in, in a whole, uh, many people with uh, these dynamics of wanting to move research further, it will be easier because that dynamics is implemented because when people, uh, they, they look into the rhythm, then they get into it because they understand that's a good flow. If people are happy, they will be producing the same. And uh, I used to say to my teams that I always uh, like to work with happy people. So we better let them happy in a way, because if they are happy, they will make me happier. So that's that's one thing. That's a, a positive thing that you can get from managing people. And so um, in the end, uh, we can move further. Uh, changing is good. It's a challenge, but it may allow you to move further away than you were in the beginning out of your comfort zone. Yeah, yeah, okay. I don't know if George wants to comment the university. Yeah, of course I'm very pleased <laughs> that uh, people, we can attract the best researchers in the country. It's the only way to turn the university a reference. So, and I think this is the way. And I mean, in Portugal, we are a small country, but it's, uh, as I said, everybody should be proud of a researcher like Goretti that showed uh, is incredible skills in developing new technology in this area. And, and I think I'm talking about by me, but I think Luis will agree with me that organized this seminar. I mean, it's really impressive the level of speakers that we could gather for this, um, for this seminar. And, and this is a very good news for us. It's really impressive. For us, such a small country, we have, at this time, we have researcher that can compete with anyone from any part of the world. And this is, I think, very um, satisfying for everybody that like, uh, and we should be proud of them. So, and if this, this um, 
we search and move to Coimbra, to the University of Coimbra, is even better. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, George. <sir. laughs> Any more questions? No? So, uh, so again, great. thank you very much for your availability to be with us and to share your knowledge today with us. And thank you everybody for participating in this um, webinar. So please save the next date. So the next seminar is going to be on 28th of April. We have Professor Adeli Menos. And uh, the other one will be on 26th of May. We have Professor Zoman. And I was just talking about brilliant people, so you can see from the list. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's really impressive, the list of names that we got for this seminar. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. And thank you very much. See you on, we'll see you on 